Welcome everybody to another episode of Voices of Influence. And today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, getting from zero to one in a startup. This is starting to become more and more uh, tougher in these days when you don't have a personal brand or like an influence. So we're going to be talking about this topic and I'm excited about this for more than one reason because of who I have over here as my guest speaker. Welcome, Dennis. Dennis is somebody that you nobody should need an introduction to Dennis. But uh, if you don't know, Dennis is the founder of Foursquare, and he has since started many more different consumer startups. And more than anything, Dennis has been like a big inspiration for me when it comes to like starting my own startup journey. So uh, I'm very, very stoked to be talking to you, Dennis. Welcome. Welcome to the show. Yeah, honored to be here. And thank you for all the kind words. It's great. So I want to take through like the, the take you back in time, right? Like it can't, I have to have a connection with Foursquare and I have to like start with that. Um, mm -hmm. What was that journey for you getting Foursquare from zero to one? Again, like, you know, primarily thinking about like that first successes, that first traction that felt like, oh my God, this is going well. Yeah. I mean, Foursquare was, um, uh, it took a long time to get it started and get some momentum. Like, I think everyone remembers it as like, hey, we launched at South by Southwest in 2009. And from there, it just kind of grew. But in reality, like, you know, we were working on this thing in 2008 and it was going very slowly. And then, you know, there was um, me and my co-founder, Naveen, we had made a decision in January 2009 that, okay, let's, let's try to have it ready in March, which was three months away. And then, you know, we came back from South by Southwest and we had thousands of users, but it's, you know, it still took us six months to raise any money because no one was really interested in the story. And so, you know, it was just like a real grind for, for you know, for probably nine, nine or 10 months where it's not a full-time job. You're not getting paid for it. You, you have conviction and idea and you just have to kind of convince yourself every morning to get up and, and do a little bit of work on the project. Got it. So, so was there like a moment where like you felt, okay, now this is got in traction or like, you know, it's closer to product market fit. Like what was that yeah. moment like? And like, you know, you, you mentioned it almost took like six to nine months or like even more for you to get to that stage. Uh, but at what point of time did you feel like traction was there? Well, we, we had a couple moments that were, that were like that, you know, but we, you know, they were kind of false starts, right? Like we re like when we launched at South by Southwest and everyone loved what we were doing, you know, that, that was one of those moments like, whoa, this is going to work. And then you come back from South by Southwest and it's like all this attention and excitement and energy. And it's like, this is, this is going to be great. But then, you know, it, it, we, we were trying to fundraise. It wasn't really working out. You know, you fast forward a couple months. Um, what, once we had our first, uh, investor, right. What first venture capitalist said, said, yes, we want to put money into this deal. Right. Like that, then the, you felt a lot of traction and then the traction was kind of real. Um, mm. and you know, I think from a product perspective, when, when the thing really started to, to, uh, to take off was, I mean, if you go, if, if you, if you go back in time, like Foursquare used to only work in certain cities, like it, it works in 10 cities, 12 cities, 20 cities. And, you know, there was a point in which we said it just works anywhere now. And that's when the growth really started happening. But I, I would think personally, it, it felt real once we were able to raise a little bit of um, fundraising for it. Like we, we raised about a million dollars in, I think, like September of 2009. And, and that was like the real, uh, the first bit of validation that we had. That's awesome. So this is great. Like, you know, like getting that first users thousand users was like awesome getting that first million dollars was there and since then you've gone on to like start many more companies as well like tell me how like the whole entrepreneurship space has evolved since then and like what is it like to like and maybe we can conclude with like talking about like what is it like to launch a consumer startup in 2024 yeah, I, I mean, it's it doesn't really get any easier to launch new things, right? Like while, while I was at Foursquare, I started a like a semi-professional soccer team, which is not a mm. tech startup, but it's, you know, it's, it's still a, a thing that you started from scratch, um, which is just, you know, it, it's, a, it's a different uh, different type of enterprise, right? But it's the same list of 
you know, 1,000 things that have to get done and let me do 10 of the things every day over the course of 100 days, right? Um, yeah, I, I work on another uh, project that's kind of like Soul Cycle, but for pickup soccer, it's called Street FC. And that was another thing where it's just, okay, we, we want to make these pickup soccer games in New York City and a bunch of other cities. And it's, it's a combination of digital and it's a combination of IRL, like real world stuff. And it's just, it's just grinding through and doing all of the things that you have to do to make, to make it work. And then I'm working on another project now that's kind of like a, an AirPods version of a, of a city guide. And, you know, it, it feels like very early Foursquare in the sense it's like, it's not a company, it's not a right. job. It's like an idea, it's somewhere in between idea and, pro and project and maybe project and product. But like every day, you just have to convince yourself to work on it. Like I, I'm working out of a co-working space now. I, I don't have like a real office. I don't have any coworkers. I don't have, um, you know, people holding me accountable. You know, there's no company meetings or anything like that. There's no people to report to. And so when, you, when you're missing that infrastructure, right, like because it's not a company, it's not really a, a real thing yet, like it's, it's your job to hold yourself accountable and it's your job to you know, kind of give yourself a kick in the butt every day to, to make some progress. No, I, I really like that. I think in many ways, like, as you have mentioned, things have gotten like uh, a lot, the, the core of it has stayed the same. It's still like the challenge. It's still like getting there and doing it. Some things have gotten much more harder. Are there any things that have gotten like way more easier now uh, than it used to be? Um, like, you know, when you started Foursquare? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. Um, the things that are that are easier is like when we started Dodgeball, which is my company before Foursquare, right. like so many people told us it was kind of a, a dumb idea. It's never going to work. Nobody wants this, you know, mm. and and you don't you don't know any better. So sometimes you kind of believe them. Right? Well, these people <laughs> are older and more experienced and have better jobs than I do. So they must be right. And, um, you know, we, we heard that again with Foursquare. Right. It's like uh, when we started. You, you already did this company. You already sold this company. Why would you do this again? Nobody wanted it, you know, and you, you doubt yourself. And, you know, like you, you still doubt yourself with every new project, but like I think you have more confidence that maybe you shouldn't be doubting yourself. And so I think that that's that's a little bit different. Um, the other thing is just kind of like rep, reputation. You know, I think mm -hmm. from doing a couple of things, I'm, I'm flagged as, um, you know, entrepreneur that has done a couple successful things or pseudo successful right. things, whatever. And so like, it's, it's easier to get meetings. It's easier to, you know, to, to kind of have those conversations about fundraising. I feel like I'm like a known quantity now, as opposed to starting from scratch. Right. When we try, we try to raise money for dodgeball and no one even wanted to talk to us. Right. I mean, I was like really humbling, really hard with Foursquare. Like everyone wanted to talk to us, but everyone said no to us. We had like 32 people say no to us. Uh, you know, and so, you know, things after that, people are more interested and proactive and in, in being involved. Like if you're doing something, would love to invest, right? So it's a different, it's kind of flipped around a little bit, but it, right. it's just, it's just different, you know? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's very interesting. And I really want to talk more about that. Like, you know, you have now and like an influence already in place but before that, like just briefly on uh, when if someone is starting right now, do you think like appetite for like these kind of crazy ideas or like things that are there has like increased or has it gotten worse right now with like the current times, as you would say, like are more people with like sort of full businesses saying that like, oh, this idea is not going to work or are like maybe it's a crazy idea, but it might have uh, chances to work because of so many other things that have come up. Like, has that changed? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. um the environment's a lot, a lot different, especially like, you know, I think post, post NFT and post crypto and mm. post web three. And I, I think it's just like, it's a, a different fundraising climate, especially for things that are, you know, like I feel like I'm making consumer toys, right? Mm. Maybe people will like them. Maybe they won't. It's not a piece of enterprise software. I can charge someone right out of the gate. And it's like, Oh, I have a thousand paying customers. Like, I'm going to try to make a thing that I hope a lot of people like, and I hope a lot of people use. And if they use it, then I'll find ways to monetize it. That was a real sexy, commonplace story, like 2008, 9, 10. And right. I think a lot of investors have become weary of those types of pitches and stories. Um, just because, I mean, how many breakthrough consumer apps are there a year? Like one, maybe? Right. 
so it's you know it's like a needle in a haystack type of thing like i i have the good fortune of like hey i i made something that people wanted to use and actually i've done that a couple times so so maybe i'm a, a better bet than others but it's right. still like the category is like a, a risky bet for people to make and i think fewer people are willing to make those bets for sure um you know now in 2004 i'm sorry 2024 than they were say you know 10 years ago or 15 years right. ago now uh which is a great segue to my next question which is about like you know hey you are well known you have the influence and everything and like when you are like launching a company for the first time like that getting that first set of eyes and getting that consideration is like so much important and so how has this brand that you've built over time like helping you right now in your second third and fourth ventures great from like a a, a vc perspective but also from like a user perspective like tell me more about that yeah i mean i i never see it as like a brand that i'm curating i just see it as like i'm just trying to be the most <laughs> you know, normal version of myself that I can be, um, right. you know, like I think my, my personality has just been like, be super honest with people, be super transparent. You know, you, you know, this from being at Foursquare, right? Like that's just the way right. that we ran the company and the way that we ran company meetings. If someone asks you a question, you don't know the answer to you say, so you don't know if someone, you know, has a better idea than you do, you acknowledge it. Um, you know, it just seemed like the, the right way to kind of build a company. And it's just kind of the way that I've done things, like even going back to, I don't know, projects I worked on at, at grad school. Um, you know, and, but I think, um, you know, having that approach to like company building or like transparency and communication has certainly um, allowed, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we've worked on to, to, to you know, to, to be these entities that people feel emotional connections to and they feel like stakeholders and they feel emotionally connected to. Um, you know, I think I, I hear a lot of feedback like that from X Foursquare people that just like they, they really had like a great experience in the company because I think the company was just like no nonsense and no bullshit. And we were having fun. We were taking ourselves seriously. We we're super self-aware as a company and we were doing, sometimes we were doing good work and sometimes we weren't doing good work. And I, 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 I think people, I think there were people who definitely took something away from that that experience, and and I hope they kind of built it into whatever they're working on now. No, for sure. I think like a lot of uh, the uh, Foursquare people who've been through that like completely understand that cu the culture of uh, what you had over there, and I'm definitely like you know your communication to your world to the uh, to your audience has been yeah. pretty much in line with that, and that's that's been great. And so when you are now having these newer conversations, starting your next company or so, are there like a significant uh, people in your audience? I know that like whenever you start something, like I would be, uh, I want to go check it out because like, you know, I know Dennis and he's launching something and I want to go check it out. And there is probably like thousands, if not millions of people who would be in that same bucket. How has that helped in like subsequent launches for you? Yeah, I, I mean, I think you you get like a free pass maybe with the first couple thousand users, like certainly not the first million users. But, um, you know, I feel like I have enough of a following on like Twitter or threads or Instagram to, to put something out there and, you know, people will at least give it a give it a try. Right. So I mean, I have like a Google sheet or, a, you know, the, the prototype. Uh, if you want to test the early version of this thing I'm working on, which is called Bebot. Um, right. You know, people can they can sign up for it, and there's like you know, there was 50 names on the list two weeks ago, and now there's you know 300 names on the list, and it's not a lot, but like hey, that's that's something to work with, and I didn't have to do a lot of work to get the names, right. and you know, as I continue to tell the story, I assume that list will continue growing. So it's you know, it's it's there's there's a steady pool of people that will try something that I make, and I think that's like a nice asset to start with. No, yeah, definitely. I mean, like getting that like initial consideration of like the 300 people and the feedback that you get from them is like invaluable and like, you know, shortens the time duration for you to like iterate on that uh, for sure. Yeah. Um, like the only people that that ever used Dodgeball were people that we were friends with. And I would right. just go and basically like sell the product on people like a, like a salesman at a bar. I mean, that's basically what I was right. doing. With Foursquare, we went to South by Southwest 2009 and we were able to show it to like, 
2,000 people over the course of, you know, three days in Austin. And that kick started that. And like, I, I don't, like, not really going to conferences anymore. I'm more just like talking to people on the internet. But, um, you know, m- maybe that same type of thing starts. Like the, the same 1,000 people that tried Foursquare will be the same 1,000 people that tried this next thing. Right. No, yeah, I think this is uh, that, that like, when, we, when we're talking about zero to one, like the uh, strategy of uh, using a conference or like a big splash or like a PR yeah. to like get your first thing is one strategy, but like organically over a period of time, having like built an audience who you actually like work with and yeah. then, like, you know, have nurtured mm-hmm. is another uh, part of it. And and <clears throat> I think you, you kind of briefly touched about, about this is like, uh, do you do any activities that uh, that are to nurture your audience or like keep them uh, interested in what you're doing? And like, how has that changed over the many years now? Yeah, I, I definitely do stuff. I don't like, I don't have like a strategy for it. Um, but you know, like uh, stuff like this, right? Someone someone asked me to be a guest on their podcast. I'm like, of course, I'd love to do this, right? right. Like, I, I like to have this conversation. You know, your audience might like to, you know, to hear it. So, and this stuff is fun for me to do. I, I gave a talk last night um, to this group called South Park Commons, which is like a co-working space that's starting in New York. And it, it, it turned out to coincidentally be in the old Foursquare office, our, our original office. So I'm like, of course wow. I have to do this talk. It's in the old <laughs> office. Okay. Um, but you know, like you just, you just say yes to a lot of things and then you get to tell your story in front of a lot of, a lot of people. It's really just like, don't, don't overthink it. And um, you know, like my, my, I feel like my, my whole thing on social media in the beginning has been like, if someone tweets you something or writes to you, you write them back. Like, it doesn't matter if they have 10,000 followers or one follower, like you treat everyone the same and you treat everyone with respect and you try to give everyone some, some time and give, you know, give people some attention. And that's, that's just worked. So I, mean, I went to this thing last, I spoke at this thing last night and there was, you know, I did, it was like an hour long talk and then like 30 minutes of Q and A and then, you know, 30 people stayed afterwards to ask questions. And I'm like, I mean, I got nothing else to do. I'll just answer all your questions. It's fine. But I think that's like a, it's just, it, you earn goodwill by, by doing that. You know, you earn good karma by doing stuff like that. No, I think this is a, this is a very important thing that like you talked about right now is like you've organically grown it by being like your authentic self and like, you know, in a way that like you're authentically a person who's like helpful, being very honest and open to other people. And that's sort of worked very well for you. Curious about your thoughts on like, you know, like now there is a but, bit of a influencer slash like creator craze that's going on in LinkedIn and everything else as well as about like crafting your personal brand or like building your story. Um, what would your advice be or like, what would your point be to these people? Uh, gosh, that, that's tough. Like, I, I don't <laughs> feel like I've, I, I, mean, I don't want to be like condescending here. Um, I, I don't feel like I've ever like built or designed like a brand or story. I feel like I've just like done things. And then when you're done doing the things, you tell the story about it and the story mm-hmm. gets longer and longer. And so um, my approach has always been just like make stuff. And then the story c- comes from the fact that you made stuff as opposed to like, I'm going to just try to tell a story about who, who I am. Um, right. And so I don't, know, I don't know if I was clear with that, but it's just like, you know, I would focus more on doing things that are interesting and having things that you can talk about than right. trying to find a way just to talk about yourself. Does that make sense? I, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think like, yeah. Focus on doing and less about like talking on what you can do and partly do is like a is a great way to uh, talk about it. Like because your actions and your successes and everything just speaks for themselves, and like you're building a brand through that um, more than when you yeah. talk about it. You know, I, uh, I actually I had a conversation with a buddy of mine not, not too long ago about this, and I think I can't remember we were talking about LinkedIn or whatever, but like it, it eventually like it kind of went to like you know when you know ten years from now and you look back on, on your career and like, you know, what are the things you're most proud of? I kind of want to think of like, Hey, we, we made things that didn't exist before. And if we didn't make them, they, they wouldn't, they, they wouldn't exist. And are the things that you made cool or not? And I think of like, I made a soccer team, right? I made a company that makes it easy for people to play soccer. We, we made this Foursquare thing, right? I'm doing this other stuff. It's just like a collection of just 
weird things. And I feel like that's like a pretty well curated collection of weird stuff that I'm proud of doing. And I feel like that is, that's the sign of, you know, working, working on the right stuff, at least from my point of view. No. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it, it talks a lot about like your entrepreneurial spirit of like thinking about like, Hey, whatever I brought to the world that wouldn't have existed. Like there are categories that you've created. There are things that you've done that like wouldn't have existed, which kind of like takes me to like the next thing, which is about like, you know, it's like, Hey, what's next? What's going on mm -hmm. in your world right now? What's uh, you briefly mentioned this like AirPods thing, but like, tell me more about like, what's uh, next in your world. Yeah. I, I mean, I, um, I like to build software that changes the way that people use cities, right? And specifically like software that tries to like bridge the gap between the online world and, and you know, IRL, the, the real world. And, um, you know, that's kind of what we did with Dodgeball and that's what we were doing with Foursquare in the early days. And like, I, I've kind of just given myself like permission to go work in the space again. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to build a, a version of an app that like you never have to use. Like you just download mm -hmm. it and you just, it goes in the background and you just walk around with AirPods in and it tells you about stuff that's happening. And it's like, you don't have to turn it on every day. You, there's, okay. there's nothing to like or comment on. There's nothing to scroll through this. There's nothing to do in the app. The only like move is just walk around you know, like walk by stuff and sometimes it says something and sometimes it doesn't it's it's i mean i don't know if it's gonna work it's right. weird you, you might hear two things a day you might hear one thing a day but it's like you know it's designed to be light it's designed to be like a a walking assistant like a version of ways for people that walk around you know like mm. a, a little drumbeat of information you know as you move through the city so it's a, it's a very light passive experience I like it. I'm very intrigued. I'm a, I'm obviously like a, a big fan of location-based stuff and anything that's mm -hmm. like local, like explores your city better are all things that like I have my ears tuned towards very literally over here. But uh, there is a, um, is this like built more for like the the tourist kind, like the common person or like, what is it? What are you thinking right now? Yeah, it's, it's not like, it's not a walking tour, right? People have done walking tours where like you, you have like a, oh, yeah you know, a tape or a CD or, or like, you know, th there's, there's been digital ones too, where it's like, start here. We're going to go on a 20 minute tour, take a left, take a right, do that. Like, it's not that it's more just like you, you, you just put it in. And instead of listening to a podcast, you, you know, you, you don't listen to anything, right. It's like, you might mm -hmm. be listening to music and then this thing will pipe up and like, it will lower the music and tell you about like a bar that just opened, or it'll tell mm -hmm. you that like somebody knows a couple blocks away and then it will put your music back up. Right? Or it will pause the podcast and say like, hey, did you know about this cool piece of street art up here? Like, go go look up. And you're like, oh, yeah, look at that. And then it starts your podcast again. So it, it's meant to be just very, you know, it's like, I always think it's like poor man's augmented reality. Right? Everyone thinks of like Got augmented it. reality as glasses. Like, it's, not, it's nothing visual. It's just, just audio. It's like the simplest version of AR you can possibly imagine. Very exciting. I, I think I'm really excited. Like, what's, what's keeping you, like excited i mean i think like you mentioned that like bringing things to life that didn't that wouldn't have otherwise existed part of it are there anything else that's sort of fueling your like entrepreneurial spirit and like you still want to like start something like what's uh what's fueling all those for you it's i mean i, I think it's just really fun to build things and build things that people use and have people give you feedback on it and to see people get excited about it and you know to to you know, kind of live vicariously through these moments where like someone had a magical moment with a uh, with a piece of software that you created, right? I mean, this goes back to like one of my very first jobs in New York, like my very first product job. I was building software for, for Palm Pilots, and you know, it was a city guide for Palm Pilots, a company called Vindigo. And I remember I mm -hmm. you'd work. I was you know, it was like two thousand one. You would work on it during the day. And then you'd go out at night and you would see people using it like in a bar or restaurant. You could put your head up over the over the the booth and see someone in the next booth using the piece of software. And, and it just had this epiphany of like, you, you can have a job during the day and people will use this stuff at night. And that I just mm. blew my mind. I'm like, that's what I want to do. And that's what Dodgeball was. And that's what Foursquare was. I mean, I used to get, I used to, like in the Foursquare heydays, like, 
I'd go to the movies and I'd sit in the back row and you could see people checking in in the movie theater. I'm like, how cool is this? People are using our stuff. Like, I just, I like that. I, I get really excited by doing that stuff. And I'm, I feel like I'm just doing that again. And that is so exciting. Um, awesome, Dennis. So I have a series of questions. Like now that you are like launching your next uh, company, um, I have a series of questions and like mainly targeted at like, what's your instinct as an zero to one stage <laughs> entrepreneur uh, about your next journey? And these are in the form of like this or that question. And there's no like, oh, it okay. depends or anything. You have to pick yeah. what is like instinctively like makes sense for you. Uh, and you can briefly explain whether uh, why you picked that or not, um, or it's okay even if you don't have to. So let's start with this. Hold on, this 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 feels like a game show. It's like very it is. exciting. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So will you launch more uh, minimum viable product or a fully developed product? Oh, MVP. MVP. Yeah, like that. There's that quote, like if you are not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you have launched it too late. Like that is my right. philosophy. So. Perfect. That sounds great. And how, how would you be funding your startup? Bootstrap, VC backed? Uh, a little bit of both. Right now it's Bootstrap and we're probably going to go try to raise some money for it. So you got to well, prototype this is, through Bootstrap. This or and that. You got to pick one. Like, you know, well, <laughs> yeah. but the answer is both. But yes, VC back. <laughs> VC back. Okay. Got it. And then again, like this need not be specifically about this. This is just like, what is your instinctively like what yeah, would yeah, you yeah. go after is what I am like. It's not like specific about this startup or anything. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So how would you build this product? Do it yourself, outsource it. Uh, do it yourself. Got it. Okay. I'm guessing like you care a lot about like the user experience and that to like, let it be outsourced or what's your uh, philosophy? I, I mean, I, I know, even though I'm not writing the code, like I know enough about what the code should do and feel like that I feel like I can, you know, I want to work very closely with the developers that are, that are doing that. And it's like, you know, if you're a technology company and you're making technology, you should probably be the ones making the technology, not outsourcing it to somebody else. So perfect. Yeah. Okay. All right. Your, would you prioritize the hustle working long hours? This is maintaining life balance, work-life balance. Uh, all in on work-life balance. I got okay. you know th three little kids, and like I'm always prioritizing that. That's awesome. Yeah, I think this is a uh, this is a lot that people need to hear about, like how early stage startup need not be like the ADR, or 90R, where like you are forgetting your family part of it. You can start a yeah. company with like that work-life balance. Um, well, hold okay. on. I mean, yeah. so I was, when I was at this thing last night, someone someone asked me that question. It's like, like what what's your work life balance with your new company? And um, you know, I was like, listen, when we did Foursquare, like I wasn't wasn't married, I had no kids, like, and and I was working all the time. I worked all the mm -hmm. time for like five years. And you could mm -hmm. say it's not healthy, but you could also say like it's probably the reason that like we went from right. zero to one. And so I I don't know if like I'm ex I'm I'm expecting this to work, right? I right. think I can still make it work, but um, I I mean I haven't I haven't done it yet. So like maybe you can ask me this question again in like six months, and I'll, I'll maybe have a better answer. No, that's a good point. Yeah, I think like uh, we if we like really think about like which of the companies have done zero to one successfully, and I've also done it while having a work life balance. I don't know if you would have like many examples in that bucket. Yeah. So it's actually yeah. like, important to have the conversation, but still like knowing that you would prioritize work life balance right now, knowing what you've done is like that that's that's good to know as well. Yeah. Um, last couple more we have over here. Um, what's your style? Would you Take an idea and keep improving on it, or like pivot, pivot when like you and you get feedback. Oh, um, I'm super stubborn, so I would say like iterate. Iterate. You know? Okay. Like I this thing, I think this thing is gonna work. I can feel that this thing is gonna work. I'm gonna keep iterating on it until it works. That's awesome. That's good. That's good to know. Who would you focus on attracting as first users? Like early adopters, mainstream market. Uh, early adopters, 
right? I, I make the, the prototype that we have now, it's pretty ugly and buggy and you kind of have to know what you're doing to get it to work properly. And, you know, you, you test all the bugs out on the early adopters and the, and the people that are just really excited about trying to do it and make it work. And then, you know, things eventually make their way to the mainstream. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, there's like, obviously like some people who are more around the lines of like, oh, I'm going to build a product that's like so well done. So, which kind of like segues to the next question is like, how would you acquire your first customers? Organic, paid acquisition? Organic. I think you got to show that like people can come in, people will come in and they will stick around uh, before you spend any money at all on paid acquisition. You know, For Foursquare did, I mean, we were organic for six years, seven years, mm. right? Without even pay, without paying a dollar for any paid acquisition. And I know it's a totally different time, but I feel if, if you can't make something that people just want to use just because the thing is cool, then like you're, you're doing something wrong. Right. No, got it. Um, last question. Well, how would you build your team? Would you try to keep it lean or would you like quickly expand? Uh, keep it lean, raise a small amount of money um, and just have a small scrappy team that can do a lot with, with a little. And like, I'll, I'll add to this, I would try to get the team to be together in, in real life. I would not do a remote team. Um, hmm. I, I tried that with another thing in the past and it just, I just don't think it was very efficient, right? I think the most efficient thing you can do is get a couple of people that you've already worked with that you know are really good that are can work well with each other and just, you know, you don't have to grind it out 12 hours a day, just get a good like six hours a day in and that's, that's what I'm hoping to do. This is very exciting. That is, this has been a pleasure talking to you. I know that like I've run out of questions over here, but I could keep talking <laughs> to you about these topics over here. Uh, but it's been a pleasure talking to you and like, thanks for showing up and sharing all your, uh, thoughts on like taking a startup from zero to one and sharing your experiences through it. Yeah. So super fun. I really enjoyed the game show format at the end. I, I hope I, hope I won. <laughs> <laughs> You're a winner for sure. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Of course. See you, buddy. Be good. See ya.